The stars know who you are. Get ready to dive into your personal solar return chart and discover what waits for you in the coming days, weeks, months, and even years. Connecting to your astrological alignments will help you to optimize opportunities and understand the path of your life and your soul. This live two-day online astrology workshop takes place February 26th and 27th and is perfect for beginners and the experienced alike. Make sure to check out all the details in the link in the description and we hope to see you there. Hello and welcome to today's video. I am Crystal Ann Compton. I'm so excited to be here with you. I hope you're having a beautiful day wherever you are on the planet today. Before we go any further, I just want to ask you to please remember to like and to comment and to subscribe. It really does help me in this work. And so thank you for that. What you are about to watch is my most recent episode of Life Magnetics, soon to be renamed. I'm thinking about Psychic Starship Earth, which I discussed with Alicia, but we'll see, but um, soon to be renamed, but it's my most recent episode. And in it, I discuss with Alicia, who is a moonologist and an astrologist. Well, we discuss all about astrology because I actually don't have a really great working knowledge of this system. I know some of the basics and I know people who represent certain signs, but I don't know much about it myself. And Alicia was the perfect person to talk to. She's going to break down all of the signs and talk to us about the nature of the sign and also the shadow of the sign. She also gets into the moon and the ascendant, which I thought was the same thing. It's not the same thing. And we close out this podcast by talking about 2022 and what we can all expect to experience in this year and maybe even next year. And we actually talk about the rest of the decade. So this is such a cool podcast. I really hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's get into it. Well, welcome Alicia Clark Tepper to the Life Magnetics podcast, soon to be renamed. I'm thinking of psychic starship earth oh <laughs> which is like polar i just <laughs> want to bring some <laughs> i was thinking of the name there for a second the magnetics and then into the starship, starship. i love it well and the that... starship leads much more to what is coming yeah. oh i mean i think so and it kind of aligns with it's got a funky and and happy vibe to it but it's like it just it covers everything it's a psychic starship and we're here on earth right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> if you want a theme song, you could tap into the Jefferson Starship. Uh, see, good ideas. Such Sorry. a good idea. <laughs> Dating well, ourselves here. I know. Well, me especially, not necessarily you, but Alicia Clark Tepper, before we get into planets and houses and stuff like that, all things astrology, why don't you tell everyone listening who you are and how you found yourself to be so interested in astrology. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, my name is Alicia Clark Tepper and oh, finding my way into astrology. I am a pattern kind of gal. I like to recognize the patterns in things. And once I realized how astrology can help me to connect the patterns, which then become our cycles. It was like every neuron in my brain started firing and I haven't stopped studying astrology for six years straight, like just contiguously in different classes, different books, different uh, workshops and uh, synthesizing all of the information. So uh, I have taken Vedic astrology as well as uh, Hellenistic astrology. We also have uh, uh, evolutionary astrology. I have taken uh, traditional astrology as well as elemental astrology. So uh, although there are all those different categories, astrology is the base. And then you have just different ways that you can use the tools within that. And so... Um, I have to say that with astrology, it is never ending. And that's what caught me. I have found the end of subjects before and just been like, oh, well, hmm, I guess I'll 
carry on to the next thing. And that doesn't happen in astrology whatsoever. It just goes on and on and on. You know, you bring up a good question for me because I've had my like birth chart read and then I guess by a, a Hellenistic astrologer. And then I've had my Vedic astrological chart mm. read. Two totally different types of readings. Can you kind of speak to the difference between those two things? Uh, it stems back to... Uh, I'm trying to come up with a date. I am not a history person. So uh, the era of when me, uh, Greek ran an empire um, and it included Italy, it included the top of Egypt, it included, um, so, so the territory was not just Greece at the time. Again, I'm not great with dating that. So that's okay. But with that, the uh, methods of the astrologers of those times also linked with the times of the Indian astrologers. And so the Indian astrologers uh, continued their type of astrology, though, on a continuous basis, same kind, always evolving, learning more, picking new stars, uh, figuring out new ways with planets, but they have not changed their system. It's, it's remained pretty... Um, steadfast through the whole time. Whereas what would be considered uh, the Western astrology, the traditional astrology, the Hellenistic astrology, they have peaked and valleyed at different times during different um, uh, eras. And then now we have many more types of astrology due to people focusing on various aspects of it. The uh, Vedic astrology, though, tends to be um, a little more trying to maybe harsh yeah <laughs> totally totally I like to no I was I mean and I got theory. I got a reading from a really great practitioner and I mean it was just chock full of great information I learned a lot but it really dealt with shadow stuff for me and it was like so many so much Saturn I'm like I'm tired I don't want any more Saturn because it feels like it's a bummer and just like the ages really focused on challenges and like things that you would have to compensate for. So yeah, I, I, as someone who doesn't really understand astrology so well, I got that vibe from the difference between those two types of readings. And to say harsh, yes, it's just that they don't, they don't tend to be towards the optimistic side. It is much more done on a, here's the facts. This is what you, this is the cards that you decided to come in with, which again is the idea of the birth chart. So the way the stars aligned at the exact time that you were born is how that birth chart is, um, is, uh, uh, mapped out, positioned, calculated. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lacking the, lacking the, the word for that. Um, but in, in that aspect, the the Vedic astrology has all of these different ways that they use the planet positions as well. And they, they call, like I'll refer to the nodes in my astrology, but they call them Rahu and Ketu and, and give them, they have a little um, deeper meaning. And it's a, it's a lot of what our, yes, our underside goes through, our, our deeper shadow side, where in the, the Western tradition, we've included more of the um, happier side of things because we've we've focused more towards the sun mm -hmm. aspect where um, I, I won't speak to what the Vedic actually pinpoints and uses as their focus. Interesting. That's that's great because I just felt that and I didn't really necessarily know I, I walked away from the Vedic session like with a lot of interesting information to think about. And of course, as spiritual people and practitioners, and I know you agree, we definitely stress to do shadow work and like look at those underpinnings and those things that kind of cause you to do things and behave a certain way. But I do like that dose of like, make it make sense and make, give me the hope in it all, you know, like tell me what to shoot for so I can optimize what, what's going to happen in my life. So yeah, I, that's very interesting. Yes. So now I, I was wondering, because again, I'm, I'm, I have astrology, if I could pan over and you'd see all my books, I have many books on astrology, which I have read and looked through, but astrology for me feels a lot like mathematics, mm. angles, and things are over there on the angle and it means something. So I'm just not, I've never been somebody who is aligned to that way of thinking. And so it's hard for me to, 
we're going to talk today and I'm going to walk away and I'm going to forget what my ascendant is. <laughs> I'm just like, it's hard for me to retain this stuff. So I'm hoping you'd be okay with just having a conversation with someone who's not really well versed in astrology, because I think that's a lot of people. A lot of people want to know more, but they just, they get all this information. Where's They're like, that? I don't know what's happening. So I thought maybe we could go through sun signs and talk about some of the primary traits of the sun signs so we can have some people listening connect to their own stuff. Is is that does that sound fun? Absolutely. Yes, okay, I'd so, love to. So with the zodiac, do we start with Aries? Is we start with Aries? So when orienting yourself with the zodiac in the natural state, Aries is considered house one. And that will work its way all the way around to Pisces, which will be 12. Okay. Uh, with Aries, if you think of the zodiac also starting at the zero point with Aries, so brand new, fresh, like straight out of the birth canal, fresh. You've never been here before. You take your first breath of air and you are transcended into this very different world. And you have an innocence, a, a desire to just experience things because you're here and it's all so very new to you. That's the, the idea behind the Aries. They have that passionate, pioneering innocence of like, hey, everybody, I just found this out. Come follow after me and I can help you to experience it too. No. But the th next part to an Aries is that they will then drop it off to their Taurus friend to sustain it while they continue off finding something new and uh, initiate that next spark. So that's interesting. Um, yeah. So Aries are commonly depicted as like fiery, escalating this argument. We're going to fight it out like kind of personalities. Why is, is that just because there's a lot of passion going on with the Aries? A lot of passion and that is the element of fire is the Aries. And so that is um, the, the, that spark that I was talking about right. within the Aries, that ignition to try new things and be creative and, and get the, the flames going in your mind. And so as those are constantly running, they call the troops, experience the fun, move on to the next thing, call the troops, experience the fun and keep going with that. But it's, um, it can also represent like uh, a military background as well, because it, it um, Aries is the god of war. So uh, with each type of sun sign, it's an archetypal uh, relationship. So it, it has a multiverse of meanings to each one. And, and the way that all the pieces come together is how you receive the greatest um, expression of each of your planets. Sure. So we're just doing little shorthand descriptions of the sun yeah. signs. Okay. Well, let's move on to Taurus because that's me. I'm a Taurus. I was born on May 9th. I'm the bull. I love it. Uh, you, my dear, are going to have just a whole bunch of energy uh, coming around into your sun this year, as a matter of fact. Um, but that's a, a topic for later. We'll just talk about Taurus in a general state. Uh, as a Taurus, the, the desire to put the roots into the ground. Uh, a Taurus is an earth sign. So you're going from this spark into the groundedness of earth, the practicality, the, the, seeing manifestation from those ideas that were put into place by Aries. And then they also enjoy continuing things. It is a fixed sign. And so Aries was an initiator sign. It's called a cardinal sign. And Taurus is a fixed sign, which means that the steady and the stubborn energy can be a kind of prevalent fact with that. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> but I can imagine that your senses, all of them, your sense of taste, your sense of smell, your sense of touch, um, hearing, all of them are on high. Yeah. And you most likely have some really good taste as well. Well, you know, I do. I do like the, the finer things, but not because I like to show out. It's because, no, I love to sleep in a four seasons and I really love to have a fabulous meal. You know, it's just, I love yes. to feel and sense things, but like 
other Torians, I, I tend to get chubby, you know, hey, 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 it's fat crystal. <laughs> Enjoying yourself in life. I'm constantly like trying to like balance what I want to just take in with how I'm actually living so I can be healthy. Do you know what I mean? A hundred percent. Yes. Um, but that is a struggle for the Taurus because they also will, that little bit of stubbornness, they, they tend to get set in their ways. So then to spark that new interest to go exercise so that I can have the indulgent meal isn't always the, the equalness. They're like, ah, I'll get there one day. To say the least. <laughs> <laughs> so next up we have Gemini. Gemini. Okay. So we move into an air sign. So from going into the fire with the spark and into the earth with the manifestation, and now we're having the ideas and we are going to get them out into the world. So the Gemini is curious. It is, um, it's probably one of those signs of a friend that doesn't ever slow down. If you have a friend who is constantly on the phone, checking emails, um, running over here to go visit this friend and flying out here to go see that friend and, and just never stopping. Uh, it's the person in the neighborhood who knows everything that's going on. Oh, I just saw Johnny. He delivered the papers today. Don't forget to pick yours up. That kind of sense of a person who just knows a lot about everything that's going on around them. So does that lend itself to a shadow side of like gossip or it well, does. you hear like the two-faced nature can be the absolutely Gemini, right? the duality of the Gemini. It's so true. And so with that, you, you have the, the one who's seeking the knowledge and to balance that you have to be the one who also doles out the knowledge and that helps to keep it in balance instead of gossiping. Gemini is going to be the, the curious sign. They love to just know. They're a great teacher and artist as well because they, they have that, um, again, we're, we're in the very beginning of the zodiac. So they have that innocence, that quality of, um, actually, it's probably the three-year-old child who's asking why all the time. That's mm -hmm. like the essence of a Gemini. Why? Why? How come, mom? Let me know more. And when they learn that, they can then interact with the world in a better way and disseminate out the information to others. Interesting. Yes. Okay, moving along to cancer. So my sense of a cancer, I think Amber Poole is a cancer. She was on my podcast. She's just like a heart with hands and feet. She's just like, I just love everybody. <laughs> She's just so hot. Like naturally her disposition is very loving and connecting. Do you know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. Well, cancer is the water sign. And so that rounds out our first four elements as well. And so if you're looking at the way the zodiac works, I'm going to pop in something before I get to cancer, is that like the first four signs complete what would be considered like through our through our 20s with our learning. Like we've, we've gotten through the college point. And then after this, we then get into where we would be considered the, the whole working life point. And then when we get around to farther in the Zodiac, the last three, it's, it's more of our, our achievement in, in, in our getting to the point of finishing our career. And that is so interesting. So the first four signs are, were the, were the kids, yeah. <laughs> were the kids with the innocence and the energy. And then we just start kind of going through the stages of life as we mature learn, grow, establish, and achieve. That's interesting. I had never heard that about the Zodiac. And that's part of the evolutionary astrology. So as you're working your way through the chart. Uh, so we'll go back to Cancer. So Cancer is, um, Cancer's uh, actual sign that you see is a crab and a crab carries its shell and its home on its back. So they welcome everyone in with a, with that, um, love and that nurturing that you were talking about from Amber. It, it can be the need also to um, love everyone, but then also to retreat a little. Mm -hmm. So a cancer does like to make sure that they have their own time to step back and allow them to find separation from the collective to themselves. 
And so with that, though, if you think of how we are then going into the Leo, we come from carrying our shell in our back and, and, and being uh, potentially in our sanctuary to really get used to ourselves and our energy against, the, not against, but in, in the opposition to the collective's energy, we then go into Leo. And Leo is the lion. So we start back over with fire again. So now that we've been in our shell and we've learned and we've figured and we know exactly how we fit into ourselves, we now go out into society and debut ourselves. And look at me, I'm proud to be who I am, my own authentic self, and see what I have to offer the world. Um, Leos are so charismatic and passionate and love also with every ounce of their, their being. Can we talk about <clears throat> the shadow of uh, of the Leo too? Because I, I have a few Leos in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I have a podcast with Brian Fisher called Spirit Pop. And, you know, he's just like, <laughs> he's just like out there. Do you know what I mean? And he's he's done all kinds of things. He's always sending me little clips of himself singing and doing things. And he's just like yes. so fun though. And then I have another Leo in my life who I want to say is maybe in the shadow of their nature because they're a little bit more timid to let their authentic self shine. And they have a little bit of anxiety as well. And I'm wondering if it's because they're in the shadow of their nature and not necessarily, but maybe it's the moon stuff. Maybe it's a node somewhere, but it just well, seems like, what is the shadow of the, the, the Leo? Uh, well, the shadow of the Leo is, is not being seen. So like you said, kind of shying away from things. So it's either that or it's so proud that you don't hear anything else. Mm -hmm. I am the only one that matters. So, so you have the two sides to the Leo and, and finding the balance in the middle. Now, when you were saying that your friend has not as, um, uh, doesn't want to be seen as much, there are placements in the chart and uh, planetary happenings that go on that can affect that. And sometimes it's just a cycle like right now in my own life, I am in the last three months of a phase where it would be considered the last couple days of Pisces. And then we're going back into Aries again. So, so we're squeezing out. And when that happens, things alter the way that you present yourself from your original um, sign. And then you spring back into a brand new you, the more authentic self. Interesting. Can I, can I pause here to ask you Absolutely. a question? Because I'm wondering how it feels within a person when these shifts take place in their chart. Like if we're squeezing out Pisces, getting into Aries, what is the actual human being feeling? Is that showing up in the mentality, the emotionality? Like how does, how do we like begin to notice it? Cause if we don't know how it feels, we're not noticing it. Do you have any? Absolutely. Um, it feels like I am, I would, I love communicating with people, especially on a broadcast like this, but for me to go out into public and leave my home, um, I'm not really jazzed about that unless it's really something great um, because I, I want to work on myself. I want to figure the things out and the desire, the outward extrovert is not there. Um, an introverted extrovert would be the best that you generally can can find in that aspect because it's that anytime we're at the very point of squeezing between one thing and another thing, you've got to get rid of what it is that's mm -hmm. hanging out within you before you're ready to actualize the next part. And so with each one of our charts, uh, that happens to us. And in different aspects. So that's why like maybe mine is going on for my internal side and then maybe somebody else is having it happen on the opposite side of their chart and they're squeezing out the very end of a marriage or they're squeezing out the very end of familial obligations mm. or they're squeezing out the very end of their career. So, so as we move through different areas in the chart, it's different focuses that we have. Okay. <clears throat> I was just wondering if there was a, a sense of like maybe even an intuition that things are shifting planetarily or mm -hmm. astrologically and how, how we can kind of move with it because not everybody's willing to divorce yet. You know, so what happens when 
we're not connected to what's happening and how we're being pushed, if you will, but we resist and stay. Mm. It's, but I mean, you probably create problems for yourself is what I would imagine. Well, with every planet, it has a cycle to it. And the easiest one to reference that a lot of people know is a Saturn return. Um, and that happens at somewhere between 28 and 30 years old. And every seven years, though, seven and a half years, uh, you get a, a reoccurrence of a, a scenario in your life, a decision that you have to make. And they're like, hey, are you still on board with the way you've been doing it? Do you want to change the way that it's going to, to uh, be reflected in your life from this point forward? If you're okay with it, then you're going to get the same old, same old, and you continue down that path. So if you decide to even make the awareness that you want to make a different choice, here come different things for you. So, um, so maybe it amplifies momentum if you, if you partner with what's being offered. Yes. And when you fight it, it fights back hard. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'll just use my husband last night. He was making dinner and he has thrown his back out because we got a snowstorm. And um, he said something and I was like, why don't you take an ibuprofen? We don't generally take ibuprofen. And so he's like, oh no, my back's fine. Two seconds later, he shot and landed on the ground. And I was like, yeah, your back's fine. Like when you're not working with it, it, and then he was out there angry, shoveling snow. So it located itself in the body and, and it just all is the same thing. So the, the astrology can pick up on each of those. And so like lower back pain, that's, um, there's a couple of different people that could be associated with that's like Saturn, uh, constriction and restriction. And so if, if Saturn's coming across and you happen to just be catching the right thing and you, you have a sour attitude, you can throw your back out or, Hmm. um, but if you, if Saturn's coming up and you're like, okay, I'm open to maybe, uh, uh, Maybe I can get the kid down the street who's got the snowblower and he can come down and do my yard. And and you come up with a different idea. You may not stick so solidly into that wedge of of the downside of a transit. Well, sorry to detour us. I just had questions, you know. (laughs) Um, Let's move on to Virgo. I know you're a Virgo. I was married to a Virgo. I have a sense of a Virgo. My, My sense is very organized. Here's my one word for a Virgo. Stacks. And what I mean by that is <laughs> I would walk into my ex-husband's office and there would just be stacks and stacks and stacks of organized chaos. He knew what was in every stack. I, it would just look like chaos to me, but he knew what everything was. And he was always like budgeting or running numbers or just organization and stuff. And when he was in his shadow, he was not organized. He was letting things get away from him. He was having a hard time just managing life. So is that close to Virgo stuff or what? That's spot on. Uh, uh, Virgos are actually the order in chaos. And so I love the way that you said that. That's why I was like beaming as you had said that. (laughs) Yes. Um, And and we thrive in making the organization throughout that. And so our goal as a Virgo is to be of service. That's all. That's that's it. And so... um, uh, side story about myself growing up, I always, always, always uh, picked up the dishes after everyone at every meal and was like the server from like seven years old on. Go in, clean the dishes, do the stuff. Lo and behold, I became a server for many, 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 many years. But just that ingrained service of I see the next thing that needs to be done. Let me make sure that that gets done in its most appropriate and efficient fashion. And uh, we also, though, rule the body. So uh, natural medicine and uh, acupuncture, as well as herbalism, uh, they are the things that go hand in hand with the Virgo as well. Uh, You can also be in the medical industry. We really have a lot of um, focus on, on that service and body aspect together. Interesting. I remember his 
he was he did a he actually did a lot. He was a fighter pilot. He turned into an attorney. He went into the legal field. He he accomplished quite a lot. Wow. But his deepest desire was like if he if he had it his way, he would like be a monk. Like he would go to some sort of a retreat space and just contemplate. Like he was very into quietude and things like that. From a fighter pilot to quietude. I, I know. <laughs> I'm like, what are, you, what are you doing out here? And I'm like, yeah. But in in an astrologer's sense, I instantly was like, oh, he must have had, when he was the uh, fighter pilot, must have had a big fiery um, transit going on for him mm-hmm. that made him want to be out there and adventurous and doing things. And then all of a sudden it moved in time to a focus. And so so my my uh, would be, was that within a short period of time that he went from one to the other or was it? I mean, 10 tw- years, tw- so? 20, 10 years, about 10, 10, years. 10 years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So not as easy to pinpoint, but yes, it, it it's just that when you're in a fire sign, you're out there doing and experiencing so much more. Whereas if you're in a water sign, it, it leads to much more being introspective into yourself. And, and, it changes so every year. Now your birth chart doesn't change, but every other aspect in astrology changes. It's so fascinating. And that's why it never stops. Well, let's move on to Libra because yeah. one of my favorite people is a Libra person is a Libra. And that's my brother. He's um, just, I, he's a Christian. So he's not into all the things that we're into necessarily. I'm a Christian though, but I mean, you know, he's not into everything, but I call him like a ninth level Arcturian starseed because he's just such a beautiful person. And I'm not sure if that's inherent to, to Libras. Um, he's a very fair person. Cause I know there's, you know, scales of justice. He's a very giving and kind person. So tell me a little bit more about Libras. Cause I really don't know. A Libra. Um, okay. So, so to, to start with a Libra, they tend to like uh, to be social, uh, very, like you said, fair minded, uh, they, but they it's about balance. They understand that not everything can be uh, one side. They want a win win for all of the people involved. And they are the only sign that is not represented by an actual person or an animal or a and so it it really doesn't allow for a lot of emotion in that sign. Now, now I'm not saying they're not emotional, but but the fairness is the thing that really holds true to the Libra, and then the emotions can come in. But 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 that that scale, that balancing, that how are we all going to to get something from this is is one of the the big things. Uh, again, being social, the arts and humanities, uh, uh, a lot of uh, songwriters are Libras. Uh, they, they have that uh, ability to work with music and harmony. Uh, I also find that they are great uh, arbitrators. And again, for that fairness, and you may uh, uh, like the law for that aspect as well. So um, having I think you said it was your husband who was the Virgo. Uh, When signs are really close to each other, there can be placements that overlap. So the law and the Virgo, um, he probably went through a phase with that at one point too. Interesting. Yeah. My brother is um, September 25th. So. Oh, he's real close. close. Yeah. Yeah. Close to Virgo. So you tend to take on tendencies of both signs then. Okay. So what are the shadow stuff of a Libra, if you Oh, uh, avoiding confrontation at all costs. Yeah. Uh, and you also, uh, they can tend to overindulge a little bit as well. Okay. <laughs> so true. <laughs> uh, that, but that comes back to the ruler uh, being Venus and, and she likes her, 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 um, sensuality yeah. and, and, uh, so, so they, they, I imagine a person who's out there on the dance floor and then you finish at the dance floor and then you're going on to a opera afterwards and then you grab a bite to eat after. It's like a whole day's worth of events and, and covering many different uh, avenues of humanities that can stimulate you. Interesting. Okay, let's move now. Okay. To my present husband, (laughs) who is a Scorpio. Mm. He's a Scorpio. And and I was always told, you know, ooh, avoid a Scorpio. Don't want to mess with a Scorpio. (laughs) And then I met him and I'm like, 
we clicked. Ooh, so like- very, I'm a Taurus. He's a Scorpio. <laughs> I don't know about the alignment of that, but uh, we're just perfect. Um, but I can see if I were to opine about his nature, there's a big inner world going on mm-hmm. with this guy. There's like a big inner world and <sighs> very committed, very faithful, um, protective, but like also you really wouldn't want to mess with that person. You know, you really wouldn't get want to get on their legitimate bad side because there is that stinger going on. And does that sound about right? One hundred percent. The the depth to a Scorpio is what they're known for. Uh, also, the intensity that they have. Like, um, I know some Scorpios that are pitchers. And being a pitcher on the mound, you really have to block out every other thing that's happening to to focus on where the ball is going to go and what pitch you're going to throw. Uh, surgeons are uh, uh, oftentimes have a, a Scorpio placement uh, because they can do that focus as well. And but, but then they also like to to cut into the skin and get into the blood, and uh, whereas other signs may not enjoy. That as much. And then um, with the Scorpio, though, you you are going to dive deep. They do not want small talk. They don't want the little chit chat. How's the weather? That is actually a way to really turn off the Scorpio and have them go find a conversation somewhere else. So uh, they also are really uh, just want to be loved. And it can be something where they find that it's not easy for them to accept that love and that need to dive deep. And so a lot, uh, cause I have, uh, my friend pool is quite thick with Scorpios and the, the, the desire to just feel, um, to just feel actually, although they don't want the small talk and men Scorpios in certain don't really want to admit that they have emotions. But once you kind of see that there is a tiny one, then the whole thing shatters and they can be like, oh, release. <laughs> just let me feel. <laughs> yes. But, but until then they can run a very, strict game on themselves. I'm not going to do that. This is not me. Almost robotic in a sense. But then, mm, mm-hmm. but then it just emanates from them at, about certain things. So yes. talk about the shadow of a Scorpio because mm. I'm going to take notes and then bring it, it up. The addiction. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and it's, you know, not just addiction to drugs, but addiction to gambling, to sex, to to the internet, to reading to to just about anything and it's because they they have that intensity and they have that focus and then once they hold on to something they want to hold on to it for a long time generally it's that fixed sign again so once that once that thread is woven in it's really really hard to unwind it got it Okay. Um, another shadow side to Scorpio is that, uh, again, they don't want small talk. So they're not willing to necessarily, like a Libra, hear all sides of the story. And so they can write off things quite easily if it's not um, what they're focusing on right now. I could see how... If a Scorpio was in shadow, they could be a punitive type of a person or (laughs) like kind of knowing where the soft parts and vulnerable parts are in a person because they seem to be like thinking a lot, you know, inner world stuff. I can see I can see where they might be punitive. And it's interesting because you're right about the small talk thing. I hate small talk as well. I'm just, I don't like phones. I don't like texting. I'm just like, let me eat my Taco Bell. I'm cool. I'm over here. I'm happy. (laughs) But with um, like sometimes when we were first together, we would, you know, have like your little arguments or whatever. And he just, and I was there like trying to, well, let's work it out. I've been married 1 million times. I know how to do this. Like we got to figure it out. And he would just be like very hard to get him to move in the communication aspect. I don't know if he didn't trust himself necessarily with words because of the emotionality underneath it, but lack of communication could be harmful in a relationship. So we've, we, you know, but he's moved along and we're very happy, but I could see how that would be a shadow side. It is. And 
it's the it's just that that the need the the strong need and if the, and when they latch onto something they will devour it piece by piece by piece and it's not necessarily in us in a quick fashion a scorpio will take their time with something because they want to hone that they want to make sure that it is a a, a jewel that they can hold on to for a long time oh. Yeah. So interesting. All right, let's move on to Sag, Sagittarius, because my daughter's a Sagittarius. And let me tell you about her. My daughter is so highly intelligent, like her mama, <laughs> like her daddy, really. So highly intelligent, but it's like this mix of high intelligence and high emotionality and finding the balance of that. Because when she is in her shadow, she's just a big personality. Like you feel her walk into a room for real, you know, and it's and I don't know much about Sagittarius as a sign. I probably should have looked into it when I gave birth to this child, but like she seems mercurial sometimes, you know what I mean? And very intense. Tell me yes. about the Sag. Oh, yes. Uh, speaking of mercurial, I was mentioning earlier about the Aries was an initiator energy and then the Taurus was a fixed energy. And the third type of energy is a mutable energy, which is mercurial, uh, meaning that it can change and adapt. And so that's exactly what a Sagittarius is. It has that mutable quality, the, the ability to, to be versatile in, in the situation. But the Sagittarius has an extreme, uh, a need for extremes. Uh, they've, extreme sports are something that uh, they tend to like. They like that adventure of things. And so to, to travel to foreign countries and learn and, and, and grow in, and, and the more that they can build their knowledge base, um, and also uh, a philosophical base to it as well, the, the, the hardier their spirit grows. Um, but the, the shadow side is the know-it-all. It is the kind of the opposite of what the Scorpio does. They won't even let you start, whereas the Sagittarius is over-talking you and, oh, I know this, and they're so loud that you can't get a word in anyway. That's the shadow side to a Sagittarius. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, that reminds me of a conversation we were having a couple months ago and like a, you know, a hot topic, current affair kind of came up and my position was here. And her position was there. And I also didn't have bandwidth to like talk about it. You know, like I'm not into it. Um, but she just was like, no, let's talk about it. No, well, why do you feel that way? No, I want to hear it. No, because and I'm like, I said, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> like, I'm just want to have dinner here. So I just, there's that intensity to like round table issues. But yeah, I can see just, but I mean, at the same time, mentioning philosophy and wanting to be uh, kind of in a Renaissance way, just wanting to have the information and understanding and that sense of adventure that's, that's, that's true. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so though, that is also the beginning of our, mm. as I was explaining earlier, we went through the first four signs and then right. we just got through the next four signs. So we're actually going into the maturity level that the, that's kind of that attitude of I've been there. I've done that. I, I know got it. of the Sagittarius that I've experienced things and I know. <laughs> oh god okay <laughs> all right so next we have aquarius oh, right no we have the no, capricorn i always mix those up every time i always mix those up okay talk about capricorns i know nothing about these people oh well my husband and my father are both capricorns plus three good friends of mine so i am also surrounded by capricorns and oh boy um they are an interesting sort in that achievement is their is their life goal and and what are you getting from what you're doing and how is that making me be the best at what i'm doing and so um in that they can have a, a sense of work is exactly everything in life and not have so much play uh i find that uh, they will disregard uh, things just in order to keep the business flowing, the, the business, the work, the career. And then all of a sudden 
oh, I really would like to hang out with some friends, but I haven't put in the time and effort into the relationship. So now what I want, I'm not able to do because I've got this great success over here. But now I, I don't necessarily didn't take the time to cultivate the relationships because success was my main focus. So Capricorns are the workaholics. Absolutely. Of the zodiac. That's okay. Structure and and uh, the executive and the and the achieving and the the status. Okay. Yes. Well, what about Aquarians? Yes. I mean, I did date an Aquarian. Not that it's all Ooh. about me, Alicia, but I dated an Aquarian. And my sense of it, and it, again, I I don't retain any astrological information, but my sense of him was, woo, he had a, a very um expansive perspective on things. And like he had a lot of metaphysical acumen. Most dudes that I would meet and still to this day don't necessarily have a lot of like just an ability to grasp concepts of metaphysics or just higher mm -hmm. learning expansion consciousness expansion but he was able to and also he was because he was able to do that i think that he had a lot of um maybe some feminine stuff too like he was able to balance both of those it was very loving and could express that so is any of that it. aquarian <laughs> all of it okay. uh the aquarian doesn't want to be told what to do hmm. The Aquarian does not want to do it the way it's been done before necessarily because just because that's the way it's been done doesn't mean there couldn't be a better, faster, easier, more efficient way to do it. And so the thoughts that come in for Aquarius are are more innovative. They're more challenging the status quo. They they don't want just because that's what it is isn't isn't uh, isn't something that necessarily uh, is their vibration. They also love that uh, uh, a veterinarian, the the animals are a big love of an Aquarius. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the idea of helping people on the outskirts, the the ones who are, are, again, they would prefer to be on the outskirts, but they want to, they're about the community. So they want to rally those voices together so that they can be heard and not just the popular vote or the popular consensus. Uh, no, let's hear from everyone. Everyone has a right to be included is a, is a good um, idea behind an Aquarius. So and, like activistic, humanitarian, yes. visionary kind of a... Absolutely. Scientists, okay. um, mm -hmm. astronauts. Uh, Uranus is the one that rules Aquarius. And then Aquarius is the one that rules astrology and... Um, sciences and and so all of all of the the desire to expand beyond where we are at currently is an Aquarius and they're fixed though too so um, the fixed part is all about like no I don't want what you've done that's the fixed part <laughs> so what is the shadow part well well the, the shadow part can be linked to that too because they're not willing to do what they what has been done before so they're often seen as the the um, errant person, the one who's, who's, uh, I don't want to come over into this group. I'm going to sit over here and be included by doing my own thing in the corner. I can see you guys over there, but I'm, I'm doing my own thing because it, it's going to get us farther in the end. And uh, so like the idea with the water bearer, um, back in the day, Again, I'm really bad with history, but at some point we didn't necessarily have vessels to carry water. You just had to go to the river or the lake or the ocean or whatever may be your closest body of water. And the idea of the water bearer is after um, he went away. They, everyone in the community laughed at him for his idea of being able to come up with a way to bring water to their city. And then he came up with a vessel, a clay pot, and he brought water in. And everybody was like, oh, we have water here now? You made a way for that to happen? But they laughed at him and they thought that he was way out there for the idea. But then you brought it into the collective so that everyone could benefit from it. That's so like Noah and the Ark, <laughs> just Absolutely. like building and innovating functionality to save humanity while everybody laughed and then drowned in the flood, <laughs> which sometimes happens, doesn't it? 
they can probably be the I told you so's, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, now we got to go to Pisces because for this Tori, and I've had Pisces throughout my life. Like my dad was a Pisces. Well, he's February 27th. So Ooh. yeah. Um, but he's, so that's Pisces, mm -hmm. right? Yes, yeah, so that's my mom's birthday too. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, wow. So she, February, it's Trisha Carr is a Pisces. Mm -hmm. um, my best friend for many, many years growing up as a child and into our adulthood, Pisces. And my perception for sure would be psychic, like psychic intuitive people. When that's in shadow, it can be um, uh, chaotic and sometimes even dark. Like my father lived only pretty much in his shadow, but he was, I always regarded him as a very intuitive spiritual person, but just living out of alignment. Um, and also he was a pie in the sky. He was a pipe dreamer. He was a pipe dreamer. He had a lot of great ideas, but he had no follow through with any of them. Yeah. Is, so talk to us about Pisces. Does that make sense for them? Well, we're back to a water sign again. So that right. depth is there first off. Um, and if you think of the ocean, how it is, limitless. It has no boundaries. That's part of a Pisces mm -hmm. is that they have a, a inability to feel the boundary because it, they are quite Morpheus. They are another mutable sign. And so with that, it also leads to escapism. It also leads to addiction. Mm -hmm. It also has the opportunity though, to be filmmakers. And um, I'll use, I mentioned my mom and she's an interior designer and she can walk into a box and she can be like, your windows are here. Your outlets are there. Your stove is going to go here. Your dishwasher's over there. We're going to have great light. We're going to know this. Your closet's going to look like this. And it's a box. And wow. It comes together and it just looks dynamite. And and to me, that's that ability to see the big picture and then also to funnel it in. They're super creative people as well. Like the 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 artistic elements that, that Pisces have are are really profound. And like I said, about movies and film and 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 you have the the way to take this idea and give it to others so that they can see what it is in in, in your own interpretation. Um, but they also can can really really a Pisces needs to have their own sanctuary because being that last sign, it's a little piece of everything. So it understands all of the aspects of life because as a Pisces, it's experienced all of those in, in terms of going from one to 12. With that though, they can feel the collective on just a massive basis. And the collective is, is where um, they can get lost sometimes if they don't know how to put up their boundaries. So Interesting. Okay. So with the sun signs, we've just gone through them all. It's so interesting to me because I know that's just scratching the surface of all that is possible in astrology and your personal chart or charts. But it's interesting to me how true it is nonetheless, even just discussing, discussing the generalities of the sun signs. I mean, like, that's all, it's all relatable. Oh, absolutely. And I've loved your interpretations of the people in your life and their signs as well, because it is so true. And, and you're like, gosh, that person really acts in this way. And this person really acts in that way. And you can just see the, the archetypes come to life. Yeah, you really can. Well, I have a few mm -hmm. more astrology, noob astrology questions yeah. for you. Um, because I know there are people out there who don't understand just like me. <laughs> um, so we have our sun sign, which we've just gone through these. We have our moon sign. Can you talk, or is the moon the same as the ascendant? No. Are they different? Okay. Three different things. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so yep. let's talk about the moon sign and let's talk about the ascendant. What are these and how do they relate to the nature of a person? So I would like to first describe a birth chart. And so the birth chart is actually the, the snapshot that happens when you are born. And then the horizon, if the nurse had run outside or the dad and saw exactly that point, that's your ascendant. And that is what orients your entire chart. And the ascendant changes every four minutes. 
And so that's why twins can even have different uh, personalities. And sometimes it even happens where they end up um, one being uh, in like, I'll just say one being in Aries, and then it was born 30 minutes later, and the other one is in Taurus. And so you've got one who's a real initiator energy. And then you've got the other child who's willing to do the carrying out of what that the first child saw and was pioneering with. And so it, it, adds those reflections to people just by that small little difference in the time that you were born makes your AC so unique and personal to you. Interesting. Okay. And then to talk about your moon sign, we all have a moon and the moon is actually the, the luminary in our chart that moves the fastest because every two and a half days, the moon is in a different sign. So as that's changing, it's adding to uh, when when you have your own slice of moon, that is how you show up emotionally. And it's also what happens when you're feeling pushed into a corner, how you kind of push back on that. And, and it can sometimes the fiery signs can lash out like claws and you just have to know that you have to say, I'm sorry afterwards. I'm, I'm just really passionate. Um, the intellectuals, the, the air signs will, will be more thought provoked. So they may not bring it down into the body. It's all going to be, I think I know this. I think this, I think I feel. Um, and, and then, um, uh, with the moon in a water sign, uh, the moon actually is normally ruled by uh, cancer, which is a water sign. And that has the emotional and sensual qualities to them. And that's also the intense and deep uh, aspect. And you're going to run everything through your emotional body. So there is no decision that is made that's made up in here. It's, it's all within. And then when you move into the earth sign, the earth sign is uber practical uh, being in your moon. And it's like emotions. Uh, I'm not really good with those. Let's see here. How can I how can I work to get uh, something else? And, and so they may not uh, be the most emotional, but but they want to use their hands and their senses to come up with something tactile. So so their moon needs to have an outcome from it. And with each one, uh, we were talking about a solar return chart, which is a workshop that we're doing, right? Yep. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and so the solar return gives you a new moon every year. So your moon would change and it gives you an idea, uh, a way to experience different things in life. And you're not just stuck with the original moon that you got. I think on my solar return chart, my moon is in Leo. So my emotionality is in Leo. What does that say about me this year? This year is going to be all about being seen. We were talking about that desire for your authenticity to shine in its most um, rawest form, um, to, to get up. And it's also to have a lot of fun doing what you're doing. Uh, I have noticed uh, this year specifically, I am also a Leo moon, but I'm a Leo rising as well. Okay. And I've noticed that I have been warmer like my body on the inside. And so the actual, I live in the cold. And so I've been able to go around with a tank top on and, and no socks, which is not my normal. Normally I have on three pairs of socks, six shirts, and I'm like, oh, I'm still cold. So, so you'll notice just different ways that you're, you, you personally are responsive to the elements that are in your life every year. Well, since we're talking about the solar return chart, and yes, you are going to be teaching a workshop next weekend. I'm excited all about the solar return chart and being able to look and see what's coming up for you in your personal energy and in your chart to kind of be able to know, okay, this month, this is happening and I can flow with it and optimize, or this month, this is happening. And I just want to be mindful of that so I can watch how I'm reacting and things like that. This workshop is going to allow students to be able to understand what's coming and then plan accordingly, which we love. Yes. We love to be able to foresee things around here. 
And the link to that workshop and any information, so you can go and check it out and you can register is in the description of this podcast or on YouTube, wherever you're watching this, however you're listening to this, check it out and definitely get into it because it's going to be an awesome workshop. So before we leave and um, you're going to share with us how people can find you, of course, but I did want to ask you because I, I ask folks who come on the pod what their general impressions are of the upcoming year. And I get a lot of intuitives and mediums and they kind of talk about that aspect of it. But I know you're a monologist, you're an astrologist or an astrologer. Do you have a sense of 2022 and what the energies are going to be like for the collective or maybe moving into 2023? I know a lot of people are worried because it's kind of crazy out there. It seems a little crazy out there. Uh, lockdowns, COVID, Canada, everyone's honking. Things are going on <laughs> everywhere. And it's not just us in North America, but what are you feeling in terms of the energy going forward, especially with an eye towards when things start to feel a little bit better for everybody? Um, well, the energy for 2022 has a a feeling of, I know what I don't want, but we haven't solidified all the potential options for what I could get into. So it is to take small steps forward and allow yourself to reevaluate all the newness that's going to be coming in because we are on the, on the, teetering of a whole bunch of new ideas, kind of like the industrial revolution, when all of a sudden all these inventions came in. And uh, for the next uh, 18 months or so, we've got a couple different things going on. And, and Pluto is a big player in that. And Pluto is the planet that does not allow the things to stay the way that they've been. And with that happening, it's going almost in the sky right now uh, on the 2nd of March, the, the Pluto, the Mars and the Venus all share the same degree in the sky, which when that happens, there is no um, individuality. They are all on the same page. And as that happens, we're taking a new way forward. And if you've slowly been working on that, it won't be as, robust as if you've not been doing anything with um, progressing yourself into a different thing because this energy doesn't ask you to do what has been done before. It wants you to to learn new, do new, and, and become more authentically you. It sounds like, <clears throat> so Pluto, Mars, and Venus, Mars, God of War, Venus, love and resources, inner, inner world love. So we go ahead. <laughs> divine masculine, divine feminine. Right, right. So that's interesting. So taking steps, continuing to take steps, but always evaluating. So the, the solution might not be at hand. In other words, like we might not really know all the information at this juncture. So people out there on social media screaming at each other because you know everything. Maybe you don't know everything. How about that? <laughs> but so there's more stuff coming in. We need to be observant. We need to feel that, right? And we need to also be strong in our stance, but we have to be willing so to, not feel, to not know feels like there's so you say we're teetering on like industrial revolution that so we're teetering on a big social consciousness like a, change yes. when do you feel Absolutely. that when do you feel that coming because i've been feeling that too alicia <laughs> i've been feeling that too i've got it i've got a year for it that it's lighting up for me but what about you well the 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 teetering point I was saying is in 18 months. So in like, uh, I don't know the exact day that Pluto goes into Aquarius, but that the energy of Capricorn, as we talked about earlier, is all about structure. It's about achieving. It's about goals. It's about um, like corporate and how they work. And then we're going into Aquarius with Pluto, which is about don't tell me what to do. The way things have been done before isn't going to work. And so we're at that squeezing out point mm -hmm. of everything that doesn't work for the corporate, the executive, our work life, the way that over the last two years, we've had a very different work and life balance. And so all of that being restructured, it, 2024 will be a definitively 
different feeling. Oh gosh, another election year in the U.S. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, I'm I'm sensing 2025 to 2028, high, like slash nine, like this next few years for us is going to be. I mean, I don't know if turbulent is the word, but like a lot of foundational things shifting around and re getting like the tower card almost. And like every time mm -hmm. I see the tower card in a spread, I'm like, oh, shit, there's the tower card. But at the same time, the structure does need to be dismantled and it needs to fall in order to erect a new structure. I feel like that is what's been going on. And I just know that a lot of us want to get to the new tower already, mm. though. Do you know what I mean? Like, we want to we want to have the roaring 20s again. We want to be celebratory. We want to have a vision for something. And right now it feels kind of dark and ominous out there. But it's a journey. You yeah. know, even if we get to the place, we still have to journey. And so there'll still be a place to go after that. But the, the getting there part right now is is just knowing that you choose what's right for you. And when you don't know what's right for you, know what is not right for you and take that next step towards the smallest thing that may be more in alignment than uh, because you know what's not working. And it, it's as easy. Uh, the thing that I've been doing a lot lately, and I talk about this, is taking... Uh, and using sustainable products. So I've slowly started working through my laundry detergent, all of my cleaning products, um, the, the towels that I use. And I'm trying to be sustainable and, and not contribute to the, the landfills and everything. And also for my own health, as well as the environmental health. And so picking small things, like I know that I don't want to just uh, contribute to the paper towel makers anymore. I want to <laughs> contribute to this. And I choose to buy my shampoo from a friend who makes it because I know that she makes the product and then she receives the benefit instead of just buying everything corporate, even though Amazon is so easy these days. You know, one of my uh, former sister-in-laws <clears throat> said to me something very interesting, like back in the early aughts, she said, she had read a, an article and she said that it's only possible for a human being person to literally care and, and everything that entails, mind, body, spirit, emotions, thoughts, what you're thinking about. It's only possible for a person to literally care about the amount of people that constitutes a village. Mm -hmm. So like whatever that is, you know, maybe that's a hundred people, maybe that's 20 people. We really don't have capacity as human beings to like stretch that. You can do it from a meta place and a visionary place. I can pray for the world, offer healing to the world, but I can't literally worry about absolutely everybody or else I dismantle my own self. And so little steps like that or focusing on like just shifting in ways that are helpful to you and to your community, to your village, but that also have a ripple effect out to the world is a really profound way to think about it. And it also reminds me of Esther Hicks. And I don't know why this doesn't necessarily completely correlate or align, but Esther Hicks talks a lot about approximation and substitution. Like if you can't get to the actual feeling of being the thing you want to be, substitute to the next best thing or to as high as you can go. Like yes. today I can go to, I really feel love for my dogs though, or I really feel, really feel joy when I'm gardening. That substitution is not, maybe not as powerful in terms of manifestation and creation, but it's just as powerful in terms of vibration and what's created yes. from that. Do you know what I'm saying? 100%. And yes, that is exactly it. It is. And I, it is a loop back into that, you know what you don't want and you, but the in front of you is unfathomable because the options haven't even been materialized yet. And so we are in this limbo state and having just that one thing that you know that that is in alignment for you will, will be that space to reside for the next till 2025. And that just makes it so much simpler, doesn't it? It's just more simple when you look at it um, from what you, what's possible for you to do and what feels good for what, 
for you to do. And this is what uh, Joseph Campbell was talking about when he said, just simply follow your bliss. Whatever's lighting you up, that's the way to go for yourself, but everyone else as well. So Alicia Clark Tepper, I know you offer your services professionally. You are an intuitive reader and you also offer astrology and anything else that you offer? I'm also a Karuna Reiki master, so I do energy healing as well. Well, tell the folks how they can get in touch with you. You can find me at uh, sacredlotus.com. Actually, that's sacredlotusexperience.com or sacredlotusexperience at Yahoo, as well as Facebook and Instagram. Sacred Lotus Experience at Yahoo and on Facebook and Instagram and online. Your website is sacredlotusexperience.com. Correct. Well, Thank you. I want to encourage everybody to go check Alicia out. She's fantastic. She really gets, I mean, I know we could have gone on for a long time on my solar return chart. Um, she really gets into it and, and studies the energies and can, and can um, counsel you as to who you are, because I know you deal with birth charts and things, natal charts and all that stuff. So who you are, your nature, what motivates you, what restricts, what lets you flow. And also she can look at your solar return chart and she can tell you what's coming up for you. Thank you so much, Alicia. This was fun. And I, and I'm just happy to have a conversation with somebody that breaks it down in a way that doesn't make me feel that dumb (laughs) because I'm just like, that made a lot of sense. And, and I can use that. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, The thing about astrology is that it allows us to accept ourselves and our quirks and know that that's just something we do inherently instead of finding it as an obstruction or obstacle in our lives. That's one thing I love. But at the same time, it's not like, like, well, I could see somebody saying, well, I'm just a Taurus. I'm supposed to eat Taco Bell all day. (laughs) Just like it's not it's not an excuse though <laughs> no not whatsoever but it, um yeah do i want to go over and organize my friend's linen closets when i may open the door yeah <laughs> that's just a, an inherent talent of mine but do i do it no <laughs> well this was fun such a cool exploration thank you so much and until next time everybody never forget that we've got nothing but love for you bye everybody Bye.